morning. Put our hands together. Here we go. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today is the day you have. Rejoice and be glad in this. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in this. And I will worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. I'm leaving my doubts behind I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good It's good, today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in this Today is the day You have made I will rejoice and be glad in this I will worry And I will worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say Today is the day Today is the day Put your hands together. Ah, right, you're going to repeat after me. Here we go. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I'll live for you. All my days I'll live for you. All right, a little louder. You. Yes, I will stand upon your truth.
And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Our God has come to save, is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every need. Calvary's mountain 
One day they nailed him to die on a tree In suffering anguish, despised and rejected In bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me and livingly loved me and dying he saved me and buried he carried my sins far away and rising he justified freely forever and one day he's coming oh glorious day a glorious day Bob, just a heads up, I noticed that a few minutes ago the green light went off. I turned it off and it came back on, so I don't know if that means the battery's going to die, but we'll see how this works. So um, I do appreciate Jose being with us and sharing with us. It's been a couple years since he's been here, uh, but it is an exciting organization to be a part of, and I would encourage you to really maybe visit with him, talk a little bit with him about it afterwards if, if you are considering maybe investing. Uh, they have been a part of this church. Did they help with the, the, the four-year 
they helped with the four-year area, uh, and I know that they helped with our renovation. So it does go uh, a, a long ways and, and, and uh, helps us in a number of ways. So I'd encourage you to, to check with uh, him if you have some questions about it. Let's talk about where we're going today with this uh, Back to the Basics sermon. Um, <clears throat> and I, I don't want to try to explain something that you're not going to understand because I don't understand it myself. But uh, the, the Back to the Basics was, was talking about some foundational principles that uh, we need to apply to our life and needs to be a part of every church. And we've looked at the Word of God and, and how it needs to be a part of our life. We've looked at prayer. Uh, we've looked at loving others. Now, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is I, this sermon here wasn't really necessarily going to be a part of the Back to the Basics because it, it was really focused a little bit more intensely on doctrinal issues, uh, a, a Back to the basic principle or doctrinal teaching about how to have salvation, how to, how to relationship with Jesus Christ, how to have the promise of eternal life. Uh, because here's, here's where I was going with this. This is the fifth Sunday today. And so what I thought I would do for every fifth Sunday this year, that I would look at a doctrinal salvational issue. Uh, what the Bible teaches us uh, has to be foundational in order for us to have the promise of eternal life. So today we're going to look at faith. And the next fifth Sunday, we're going to look at repentance. And then we're going to look at confession after that and then immersion. So throughout this year, you will get the doctrinal truths about how to have a relationship with Christ, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So I thought, well, that's still kind of a back to the basic. It's just a little bit different. It, it's something that focuses specifically upon salvation and having a saving relationship with Christ. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to, we're going to turn our attention to this concept of saving faith. And then over the next few months and this year, 2017, uh, you will have hopefully gotten uh, what the Bible is taught in the basic elements of salvation, of the doctrinal issues about salvation and the promise of eternal life. So let's talk about faith for a little bit this morning. We've just come off of a political season of where we elect a new president. And during the time leading up to that, there's a lot of things going on on the campaign trail. One of the things that you will find are contradictions from the candidates. What will happen is, is that uh, a, a media, a, a news media, will go back about six months and they'll find something that one of the candidates has said, and then they will go to today and show what they said and show the contradiction. Hap happened, you know, for the past year. We're all familiar with that. We saw all of the news things because this political season was like no other that most of us have seen. But even after you become president, oftentimes, there will be things that are pointed out that are contradictions. I remember years ago, uh, George H.W. Bush, the first Bush president, Is he, was he 45? Is that what he was? Is that what he was called, 45? During, what was it? 41, wherever he was, okay. So during his campaign, he made this statement, read my lips, no new taxes. Yet during that four-year period, he raised taxes, and it was a little bit of a contradiction. Even our current president, and please understand, I'm not trying to attack uh, 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 president uh, Trump in any way, but even our current president, if you remember during the campaign, he promised us that he was going to uh, direct an independent investigator to find out about these emails that Hillary Clinton had and if there was any kind of criminal, criminal issues there. In fact, probably the best line in any of the debate for years is when she was talking about, would you really want him to be in charge of the legal system? And he goes, yeah, because you'd be in jail already. And so that's what he promised us. But what happened? After he was elected and before his inauguration, he says, I'm not going to do that. Now, I'm not faulting for that. I don't necessarily think that he should, but it's a contradiction. Now, what's the problem? When there is a contradiction, you lose credibility. You begin to question, well, what can be true? Now, why am I sharing all this? Am I trying to talk down our new president? Absolutely not. What I want you to understand that when it comes to Scripture, one of the most one of the most volatile issues in the area of faith is that for years people have said there are contradicting scriptures when it comes to saving faith. That there are two scriptures that seem to conflict with each other. And so how do we know what the answer is? So the first thing we have to do is we have to talk about this contradiction. So take your Bibles. You're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, ever since we did our back to the basics about the Bible, I have tried very hard to make sure that we turn to scriptures and you're going to have a number of scriptures 
to turn to today. My hope is that when you walk out the door every Sunday morning and every Wednesday to come here, that you think, oh, do I have my Bible with me? Well, let me run back in and get my Bible because I'm going to need it. Hopefully, that's what's happening in your Sunday school classes and your Wednesday night classes is that you need your Bible. But you're definitely going to need it during worship service. Otherwise, you're going to get lost and you're going to kind of get bored as I just read scriptures to you. Um, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's take a look at this supposed contradiction <clears throat> and how we address it. Starting with verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the, rest, we were nat- we, we, like the rest, who were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in his mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now flip over, if you would, to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Easy to remember. Ephesians 2, James 2. James chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 14. Verse 14. James 2, 14. Everybody there? If you don't know, go look in your context. You'll find it. Flip over there. You'll begin to learn your Bible. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Now, i got to tell you, folks, when you put those two things side by side, it does look like a conflict. Paul says, faith alone. James says, faith with actions. It has been a contradiction for years. It's been a a source of, of conflict even among churches. How do we deal with this? Because our understanding is, or at least what we want to understand and believe, is that, that nothing in the Bible contradicts itself, because if it does, what can we believe? We have to believe that all of it is true and all of it is credible, and there's no conflict and there's no contradiction within Scripture. So what do we do here? Paul says faith alone, James says no faith in works. How does it tie together? Well, we've got to back up and we've got to kind of look at this from a context standpoint. Now, here's my understanding from doing the research here. Paul is writing to a group of people that have come to the conclusion that you can earn your way into heaven. That's what they've, they, they, they believe now. They, they believe that, that works can get them into the saving relationship with Christ. And Paul says you can't do it that way. There's no way. You, you cannot earn it for two reasons. One, and he mentions one. One, if, if, if you could earn your salvation, then you would boast about it. And if you boast about it, then it comes out of God's hands. God has nothing to do with it. His grace means nothing. And so he says, that's one reason why you can't earn it, because then you would boast about it. The second reason is this. If you could earn your salvation, when is enough enough? When have you done enough to be saved? Where is the long line drawn? And so Paul is dealing with a group of people that is saying, you can earn your salvation. James is dealing with a completely different group. He's dealing with a group of people that says, yeah, we have faith, but that means I can live however I want. I don't even have to follow Christ if I don't want to. In fact, the whole book of James is about some of the stuff they were doing that was outside of God's will, was it not? They were showing favoritism. They were using their mouth to, to destroy people and, and, and backbite people and gossip people. And he says, here's the problem. You, you say you have faith, but then you don't live how Christ calls you to live. See, the easiest way to understand this, Paul is dealing with legalism. James is dealing with laxity. One is dealing with, you have to do this to be saved. The other is, once I become saved, I don't even have to follow Christ. The, the picture would be this, an old Western movie, and you got the two heroes, and they're the two good guys, and they're right in the, the middle of the town road, right in the middle of that old dirt road, and they're back to back with their guns out just ablazing. And one is shooting the bad guys on this side, and one is shooting the bad guys on this side. That's what's going on. 
Peter, I mean, uh, James and, and Paul are back to back and they're dealing with this untruth. And this one is dealing with this untruth. And it actually becomes the very same thing. In fact, they both are saying the same thing. Look at what Paul says in verse 10 of that passage in Ephesians. He follows it by saying, for we are God's handiwork, creating Christ Jesus to do good works. He just said the same thing that James said. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this about himself, by the grace of God. Now, the word grace here is synonymous with faith. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Paul is saying the same thing. It's just that we kind of get lost in that because we, we, get, we, we see this faith alone, and that's what we want. And James says, no, faith and works, and the truth is, it is a combination of both. It's a combination of both. The best way I can describe saving faith is this, folks. It is Christ living in you and you living in Christ. So let's break that down for a minute, okay? Let's break down this concept of saving faith. And the best place to stay is in James. Because James is dealing with both. He's already made it very clear. You've got to have faith to be saved. But now he's taking it to the stance of, okay, well, exactly what is this saving faith? So let's talk about it. The first part of saving faith is knowing faith, a knowing faith. Now, what is a knowing faith? Well, we, we refer to it sometimes as an intellectual faith, but I don't really like that because it almost sounds like it's IQ-ish type of thing. A, a knowing faith very simply means that you agree with a statement that you believe to be true. That's what knowing faith is. Knowing faith is I agree with a statement, I agree with that statement uh, because I accept it as truth. Now, the way we accept it as truth is one of two ways. One, because we believe something that has been passed down to us. We believe that we believe something that someone has said. They make a statement, and because of who has said it, we believe it. Everybody with me to that point? In fact, look at, look at what Jesus says in John chapter 5. He says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. See, a knowing faith. If you, if you really believe Moses, you would have believed what he wrote. But, but since you did not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So a knowing faith is that I accept a statement as true because of what someone has shared with me, and, and I respect them, I find credibility to them, and so I, I accept that. So I, I've never met Abraham Lincoln. Never. I wasn't around. Never met him personally. But based on things that I have read and things that have been passed down, I believe he was the 16th president of the United States and that uh, he brought our country together in a very tough time of division and he brought unity back to it based upon what people have shared and passed on. And so a knowing faith is accepting a statement as truth because of what someone has said that you are willing to accept. Everybody with me there? A second way that oftentimes we accept statements as truth is from personal experience. We've experienced something, and so we say that statement is true because I've experienced it, right? So I have come to a conclusion based on human experience of this following statement to be true. Never answer a wife that asks you, is she prettier than me? Am I bigger than her? Am I like my mother? Never. I have come to the conclusion based on human experience. I'm not going to tell you which one of human experience, but based on human experience, that you never answer any of those questions. Don't do it, guys. Just don't. Now, you can try it on your own, and that's okay. And, and I'll know which one because of the bruise you have. But anyway, <clears throat> you don't. But, so, so I can accept something as truth based upon what someone shares with me or from my own experience. Everybody with me to that point? So James says, you have knowing faith. Look, look if you would. Go to where we left off there in that passage in chapter 2. Verse, uh, verse 19. You believe that there is one God good. That was knowing faith. Great. You believe one God. You, you believe there's one God. And see, listen, that, that, was a, that was a foundational doctrinal truth. You got to believe that, folks. And, and they had all kind of gods around them. They had all kind of idols. Everybody they were around trying to convince them, that's okay, believe in, believe in, in, in Yahweh if you want. Believe in Jesus, that's fine. But, but you can believe in everything else too. But they come to the conclusion that, you know what? I believe that there is one God. That's it, just one God. Not much different than today, right? Our belief is that Jesus is the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. 
You got to believe that. That's a truth. You can't believe there's all kind of other ways to go. That's a foundational truth. That's what they believe. There is one God, and James says, good, but finish out that verse. What's he say? Even the demons believe that and shudder. What did he just say? Knowing truth is not saving truth. Just because you know Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just because you recognize the fact that he died on a cross and arose three days later, does not save you. That's what James just said. Knowing truth is not saving truth. It might have an element of it, but it's not saving faith because these folks just believe one of the most foundational principles. There is one God, but they didn't do any more than what the demons did. Right? And the demons even shuddered. Every time they saw Jesus, what did they say? They got terrified. Son of God, what are you going to do with me? Son of God, don't do this. You know, they, they, they became terrified. Factual, intellectual faith of who Jesus Christ is does not save you. Please understand that truth, folks, because we've lost that, I think, in our world today. We expect that as long as people say the right words and say it the right way, that they're saved. But that's not what saving faith is. So James takes it a step further. He says, we got, we got knowing faith, but it has to be coupled with showing faith. And so he bookends these two things. He begins, he begins by saying, okay, let me give you an analogy. Or let me give you a hypothetical situation. You come across somebody. They're cold. They're hungry. They're, they're thirsty. And your, your emotions are stirred. That's not enough. Even the emotions of the demons are stirred. And you, you say, oh, man, I hope, hope things go well. That, that's not saving faith. That's not saving faith. So he says, let me, let me show you what showing faith looks like. So at the end of this section, he uses two examples out of Scripture. So go, if you would, to, to verse uh, 20. You foolish man, do you, you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what he, she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Folks, look, he just bookended these things. He said, first of all, if you've, got, if you've got something going on here and you see someone in need and you don't do anything, all you have is a knowing faith. That's all you have. Oh, I know Jesus Christ loves me. Oh, I know Jesus Christ died for me. Oh, but I'm not really going to help them. That's a knowing faith. That's not enough. So he gives us two examples, Abraham and Rahab, where their knowing faith of God and his promise was put into action. Now, hold on to Ahab, uh, Abraham and Rahab. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in, in, in just a moment. So the concept here is that saving faith involves intellectual faith, involves a knowing faith, but it produces evidence in how you live. It, it, it produces action in your life. It's not just an understanding of something. It is a living out of what you believe. Famous tightrope walker, tightrope walker. I have to, I have to slow that down. If I say, I say tie, tie rope walker, that's not right. The, the famous tight, tightrope walker, Blondin. Are you all familiar with this guy? June 30th, uh, 1859, he cross the Niagara Falls. Uh, everybody familiar with this? Uh, he was, uh, his real name was uh, Gene um, Caravet, is that right? Is that what I said, Lisa? Gene Caravet. He lived between 1824 and 1897. Uh, he did a lot of shows in England, but he didn't become famous until June 30th when he did this, this, uh, this walk across uh, Niagara Falls. He used 1,100 feet of three-inch rope, and he had a 30-foot pole that weighed 40 pounds to give him balance. And he walked across it. Now, first time he did that, June 30th, uh, 1859, I think is the date. He performed that same thing eight more times during uh, the summer. One time, he carried his manager on his back. I have a picture of it. Uh, his manager's name is Harry. I, I don't know the last name. Harry said it was the worst experience of his life. <laughs> he said it was a nightmare. Six times. Um, Blondin had to stop so his manager could get off so he could get steady again in order to continue the walk. 
The story goes is that one day during that summer, he gets up to Niagara Falls and he takes a wheelbarrow across the rope and back. In fact, we have a picture of it. When he gets back, the crowd is standing there and he said, how many believe that I can do this again? And they all went, yeah. He said, how many believe that I can do it with someone in the wheelbarrow? And they all went, yeah. And he pointed at this one very enthusiastic guy and said, get in. Said, no, he didn't get in. Now, I got to tell you something. I don't know that I fault that guy a lot. I don't know that if I was standing there that I wouldn't believe that he could do it, but do it with somebody else. You know, I mean, don't do it with me. But, but that's, that's it's an old illustration that's been used that, that you can have a knowing faith, but unless it produces action and evidence of your faith, then James says it's worthless. In fact, three times he calls it a dead faith. You know what that means? It can't do anything. It can't save you if it's dead, a dead faith. Because here's the key. The saving faith is dependent upon not you knowing about God or knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus. There's a difference. The um, Prince of Granada, who was um, up for, um, he was in line for the Spanish crown, was put in prison in Madrid in a prison known as the place of the skull. It was considered a terrible place, and everybody knew that once you went into this prison, this solitary confinement, you, you, you would never get out. When he was put in, he was given one thing that he had with him his whole time in prison. It was a Bible. He read it hundreds of times. It was his it was his, really his only companion while he was in there. 33 years later, he dies in prison. When they go to clean out the cell, they find some stuff etched along the wall. He found a nail and it etched in some things on the wall. This is what they found written on the wall. Psalms 118, verse 8, is the middle verse of the Bible. Ezra 721 contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. The ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Esther is the longest verse in the Bible. No word or name of more than six syllables can be found in the Bible. After 33 years of studying the Bible, that's what he knew. He probably knew the Bible better than anybody else up to that point. But the problem is it was nothing more than a knowing knowledge. It hadn't changed him. It hadn't made him different. And the reason is, it has to be a relationship. It can't just be, I know about Jesus. It's you've got to know Jesus. And when you know someone, it's evident in your life. See, I, I can know about my neighbor. I can know what kind of job my neighbor has. I can know how many kids they have. But if I really have a relationship with my neighbor, you will know it. Because I'll talk about it. I'll talk about how we went fishing. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things he did that, uh, you know, that makes sense to me. You will know about my neighbor because it will be reflective in my life. And that's the difference. Saving faith is not knowledge about Jesus Christ. It is a relationship that produces action and people know it. They can see it in your life. It makes sense to everybody, doesn't it? Let me show you something really amazing here. I want you to look at this passage of scripture of Matthew chapter 15. Am I close to it? Is that the one? No, that's not the one I want. Go back. Go back to the one before that. I'm sorry. I'm coming to that in a minute. I'm making them turn to that, Carla. They've got to work a little bit more. Matthew chapter 7. I want you to see this verse. Now, you've all seen this verse before. I want you to really look at this verse for a minute. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. You see that, right? So that's exactly what I just said, right? Just because you say, Lord, Lord, you ain't getting into heaven. Just because you know him and know what he does or did and will do doesn't mean you're getting into heaven. Everybody with me there? It's the rest of this verse is interesting. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Well, now, doesn't that sound like that back up here in verse 21 where he says, the one who does the will of my father? Doesn't that sound like that, that they're doing the will of the father, they're prophesying, they're doing miracles? But what's he say? Then I'll tell them, I never knew you. What? Well, Jesus knows everybody. No, no, no. You see, Jesus just sums up what James is telling us. Just because you know me doesn't mean you're getting into heaven. And if all 
you know is about me, even though you do other things that look righteous and religious and special, you still don't know me. See, it has to be a relationship. You have to know, and that's why we've talked so much over the past few weeks about when you study the Bible, don't study it just for information. Study it about the attributes of God so that you can learn about God. Look at the things that God is trying to teach you about himself, not just about facts and information. Because the fact of the matter is, folks, just because you know him, I don't care how many times you come to church, that's not a promise you're getting into heaven because that's not saving faith. Saving faith is knowing him, knowing about him, but it produces a change in how you live. Everybody with me to that point? Now, there's one more thing that's really intriguing to me. One more thing I want to talk to you about. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 15. So what is saving faith? At this point, what we understand it to be is it's knowing God, but it's knowing Him in such a way that it changes your behavior. It changes how you live. It changes how you treat people. It changes your language. It changes your attitude. It changes your action. Just saying, Lord, Lord is not enough. Just saying, I know that Jesus died for me is not enough. It has to change you. That saving faith. Folks, listen, I'm going to be honest with you, church. When I look at the two different sides here, Paul's side and, 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 and James' side, for my observation for this church, we need to be concerned about what James is saying. Most of us in here do not believe that you can earn your way into heaven, but there are many in here that don't do anything except acknowledge that they believe God. And that's not enough. Many of you think that the more you do something is an indicator, it's doing it because you have a relationship with Christ. So it requires both things. Does that make sense? I don't want to make this complicated, but please understand that the message for most of us today that come to church is not that you have to earn your salvation. It's the fact that you need to be living out your faith for it to be saving faith. But let me show you something else that's really interesting here that I never noticed before. Matthew chapter 15 um, I think we're starting with verse 21. It's really a great story, and you've heard it before. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying after us. The word there, the phrase keep crying, means over and over and over again. He answered... I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. It's kind of mean, isn't it? Kind of hateful. Jesus is having a bad day, maybe. Just having a rough day. The woman came to him, knelt down, and said, Lord, help me. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Well, that's mean, too. He just called her a dog. It's not right for me. I didn't come to help you. I didn't come to help your kind. That's what he said. I didn't come to help your kind. I don't have time to feed the dogs. I've got to feed the people. That's what he's saying. I've never heard this before. Because, oh, I can't believe that. But anyway, that's what he does. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. You know, Jesus only told two people ever that they had great faith. This is one of them. So what's going on in this story? Okay, okay, I gotta love this. This, this is good stuff here. Jesus is doing two things here. First of all, he's trying to teach the apostles a lesson. See, the apostles still were under the impression that the only one that could be saved was the Jews. That was their, that was their belief. Now, they would say differently, but, but Jesus knows their heart. And so he's, he's got he's to teach them, you don't understand, this woman, she's a woman and she is a, a Samaritan, she's a Gentile, she is a child of God just like you are. See, they needed to learn this truth, folks. They weren't getting this. The, the, listen, this is free. Everything I'm giving you right now is free. You're, you're good to go here. Look, look, listen to what I'm about to tell you, okay? They needed to hear that everyone has a right to saving faith. Everyone has a right to saving faith. Black, white, male, female, rich, poor, all of them did. 
if I asked you today to sign a document that says everyone deserves a right to saving faith, everybody in this room would sign it. But would you live it? Would you live it? Would you put that faith and that knowledge and that truth into action? Or do you refuse to even spend time with that obnoxious person at work, much less talk to them about Jesus Christ? Do you still harbor maybe some prejudice feeling back here and think that maybe someone that has a different color skin than you shouldn't really get the gospel message unless it comes from somebody else? Folks, I'm just being honest with you because that's what Jesus is teaching the apostles. That everyone, everyone deserves saving Faith. Are you with me? Now, it's what the woman says that changes everything. Because Jesus teaching the apostles, she feels a rich in it. Because what she says is, even the dogs get the crumbs. Do you know what she just said? She said, I can't do it without you. See, so that's saving faith. See, she had, she had known faith, did she not? She believed that Jesus could heal her daughter. And she had showing faith. She followed him and kept calling out, please heal her, please heal her. But all of a sudden, here's what she has. She has an understanding that she can't do it her own. Only Jesus can do it. That's saving faith, folks. It is the understanding that Jesus is the only one that can bring you salvation. It is the understanding that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and you rose to you later. But it is also recognizing that because you understand that, it has to, has to, not should, but it has to change your behavior. It has to reflect how you live. That is saving faith. Folks, he can do this to you, but there are some of you in this room today that have no faith and no saving faith. And that should cause you to tremble. Because the scripture says the Lord might return to you time. So here's what we learn. And here's where we go. This saving faith will produce the actions in your life that is evident that you believe what is said by Jesus Christ in Scripture. And the things that He calls us to do is to repent, to confess, and to be immersed. That's why we're going to look at those things throughout the rest of this year. But I want you to understand, you don't have to wait until I get to those sermons to have saved you. You can make a decision today that I believe that you are the Son of the living God and God of the and I want to repent. I want to change my life, Lord. I want to make you the priority and not something else. I want to make you the sinner and not something else, Lord. And then I want to confess you with my life. I want people to see you in my life. And I want to begin, Father, by being in earth, by just submitting to you completely everything that I am. You can do that today, folks. And I would challenge you to do so. Make sure you understand saving faith is more than anything. It is knowing faith that becomes children.